Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to come here. It's a, a very challenging subject and I think it's going to be a wonderful week. Um, uh, actually, I'm not uh, from University of Buenos Aires, which is a huge university in the capital, but I'm in the province of Buenos Aires in a smaller university, much friendlier and uh, with, a, with a nicer environment, at least from my point of view. Oh, I work there too, but I prefer uh, <laughs> the smaller <laughs> university. <laughs> well, uh, this is uh, a talk about climate, uh, disease dynamics and uh, mathematics. The tool is fuzzy logic uh, parameterization of the model. Uh, you know that we are concerned about climate change because it affects life on the planet. And one of the aspects of uh, disease dynamics is that it is affected by weather. So it is important to understand the link between climate and the dynamics of the diseases that affect not only humans, but also uh, ecosystems, wildlife and production systems. So in this case, we will be concerned about beef production in the uh, region of the Argentine Pampas. Uh, it's a very important uh, income uh, source for Argentina and uh, the problems that affect a cattle in the terms of, of health of the herds are related to weather, to climate. We have, uh, Argentina is mostly, although people don't really uh, see it that way, it's mostly a semi-arid country. And the productive area is basically uh, this area here, which is the Pampas region. We have most of the cattle is produced in the province of Buenos Aires, but you have also important production uh, areas in Santa Fe and in Corrientes. Now these areas, Argentina is a very long country, uh, are at different latitudes, and they have very different climates. The north is very warm, it's almost uh, subtropical, <coughs> and the south is temperate. And veterinarians have noticed that the disease dynamics are different in one place or the other. So they wanted us to work, we worked together with the people of, of the veterinary science department uh, to understand how parasites behave depending on the weather. And there are many uh, parasites that affect cattle but mostly Ostertagia, it's the most important of all the uh, parasites, the most uh, abundant. They have a high economic impact and the losses are basically mortality in young individuals and loss of weight, which produce considerable costs. And uh, they also have a lot of expenses in drugs to control the diseases. So uh, you see it's uh, 170 million dollars per year in uh, cost of uh, treatments. So uh, the reduction in weight also affects the production and uh, the largest losses occur during autumn winter. Uh, they have uh, a huge loss and now uh, they have resistance to drugs. So it's becoming a uh, quite a big problem. These are the lesions that appear in the stomach. And here you have a disgusting picture that shows how many parasites one animal can have. So if we look at the life cycle of the parasite, it has mainly two phases. One stage is the free living stage where the larvae of the parasites go to uh, the soil in the dung and uh, they grow inside the dung 
and they uh, stay there waiting for rainfall to wash them away to the grass and continue their development as larvae until they are ingested by the animal and go back inside the stomach, continue the development to become adults and they produce eggs. And this is the, the cycle. And then you have the life inside the animal, which is quite different from what happens outside. So we have an egg input, and uh, there are many questions. How many eggs can an animal produce? Is there a seasonal dependence? Well, we know there is. Uh, which factors have an effect on the amount of eggs produced? Then we have inside the dung pool, uh, the development from egg to larva, and we want to know how uh, long the development takes. It will depend on several factors, which are the factors that affect that development time, how they do complete their development, and how rainfall affects this de uh, development time. And also there is the migration to pasture. Uh, how does the migration occur? Uh, summer and winter precipitations have the same effect. How many days can larvae survive in the pasture? That also depends on how much sun they receive, how warm it is, and how uh, humid it is. Sorry, what exactly is L3? L3 is the um, stage, the, the uh, largest stage that larvae can have inside dung. They cannot continue their development until they are inside the stomach. So it's the third stage of being the larvae. Yes, you have uh, eggs, L1, L2, L3. L3 can survive rainfall, L1 and L2 don't. Okay, so there, there are many questions that the veterinarians wanted to, to uh, pose and, and, and have answers to. Um, how is the appearance of this larva in the uh, pasture related to precipitation? How long is the delay before the first uh, larva uh, are found in pasture? Why is this important? Because they, they uh, take the herd into a, a, a pen and then uh, the grass is clean, uh, all previous larvae are dead, but they want to know how long will the cattle be safe in that pen without being infected again. Is it possible to determine the population dynamics in the pasture from the amount of eggs per gram of dung, uh, the monthly precipitation at the time the cattle enter the padlock? So what tools do we use? They are quite simple tools. There are different equations with daily step that keep track of all the state variables and uh, the fuzzy inference systems <coughs> that are used for parameterization. Why do we use fuzzy uh, inference systems? Because there isn't enough data, uh, fieldwork data, to build the functions that relate this uh, mortality or uh, development uh, rates to temperature and to rainfall. So uh, we use these fuzzy uh, parameter functions uh, to use non-quantifiable information. For example, the people who work in the field, the farmers, they know, for example, that there is the, uh, if they have a, a strong rainfall, then this thing happens. If it's too warm, then these things happen. So we need to take advantage of that uh, scarce information we can have, and we need to be capable of putting numbers to that information. Okay. Basically, we use two types of uh, inference systems, the Tadkaji Sugino and the Mandani. Uh, they're, they're different. Mandani is uh, more of a um, weighted average, while the others is, is uh, well, I will show you a little bit how it works. It's it's quite different uh, system. So, <coughs> to start working on the model, 
the free living stage on the one hand and then the parasitic stage on the other hand. Let's work first with the free living stage. We have, we want to keep track of the amount of pre-infective, pre-infective is up to L3 larva uh, at age A that, we, that started the development on day D. Julian Day means first January is day one, December 31st is day 365, okay? So how, how do we count that? We have, oh, sorry. Well, we have that already. Uh, it's the number of animals plus a, a times a constant times the number of eggs per gram times the size of the uh, dump pad if the calf is uh, of a given weight. So it's different the egg production in calves than in cows. And there's a different equation for cows because here the constant is different. And uh, we can relate the pad weight to uh, the weight by this constant. This is the weight of animals done in grams. The uh, EPG is the number of eggs per gram and uh, the number of animals. And here's the weight of the animal, sorry, the weight of the animal in grams. This is information from the paper by Strongman. So we can write the equation about the number of pre-infective larvae taking uh, the uh, mortality of pre-infective larvae as a function of the age of the time they have been uh, living on, on, the, on the dung and uh, rainfall. And this is times the number of eggs of the previous day. Okay. So the numbers in these equations are based on fitting to some data? Or uh, <coughs> yes. They're, these are taken from the literature. Mm -hmm. Because we have also a, a, a nice uh, set of data from the people in our university who have been working for four years in the field. But this is from the literature. Okay, so this existed before you started? Yes, yes. Uh, when do larvae reach the L3 sta stage? So I said that uh, it depends on temperature and rainfall. So first we want to estimate the development time from egg to infective larva, taking into account those weather conditions on a daily basis. And the estimation of availability of infecting larva ready to migrate to pasture, that they're caught inside the dump pads. What factors affect this development? Well, on one side, temperature, and there is a lot of work being published on that. Basically, the data from uh, Bande, which is very complete, very interesting uh, lab experiments, control lab experiments. And then we also have the larval length. As the larva gets larger, it develops faster. So it's an it increasing uh, growth rate. So we can write a model, uh, this is ours, to uh, estimate the development time. Uh, it's the length of the larva a day earlier times the development, rate, the development rate depending on the temperature. If the larva has not reached the uh, maximum size expected for that temperature. And uh, the, uh, le the initial length of the larva, if it already reached the stage. Uh, and the initial conditions is the, the initial length of the larva after the eclosion of the egg. So we have uh, these three parameter functions that need to be defined. Okay, um, we will see how these are defined later on. I'll, I'll first present you the model without the parameter, the parameter functions. So the first stage 
is, as I said before, the number of pre-infective larvae at any given date and the age of that uh, larva. Then we have the second stage is the migration to pasture, which is given by this equation here. The number of uh, L3 larvae ready to migrate will be the number of larvae that, that were e existed the day before uh, that survived and they, that developed, plus those that are arriving today, that finished their uh, uh, development today. And then the larval dynamics in the pasture is quite similar, as th are those that are newcomers added to those that were there the day before and survived. So we have these three equations and the parameter functions are the rate of pre-infective mortality, the rate of mortality inside the dung, pat, and the rate of mortality in pasture, and the rate of migration from dung to pasture. These four functions will be uh, defined later on. Now, we have the larva in the pasture and we have to keep track of those. So how do we do that? We have an initial population, cohort J, uh, day one. So we have many, as many larvas at, as those that reach that uh, day the pasture. That's cohort J. And next day, we have those that survive plus those that arrived this day, too. And day three, we have those that survive from the two previous cohorts plus the ones that are arriving on day three. So that uh, the number of infected larvae in pasture is going to be those that are newly arrived plus those that survived the previous days. From the point of view of the difference equations, is there anything special about one day aside from the fact that the sun rises and sets and so on? I mean, could it be an hour, could it be a week? Uh, uh, yes, but uh, usually you have uh, weather data da on a daily basis. Temperature is taken, uh, yes, uh, you have, uh, we use mean <coughs> daily temperature for each day and we have, uh, we use the, the precipitation on that day. So th that's the main reason for, for selecting that time step. Okay, so we have here the equations and uh, we are adding those related to uh, survival in the pasture. So this will be the module for the free stage uh, uh, of, of the larva. Okay, now we have the eggs coming to uh, the soil, then the development in dung pad and the migration to pasture. And now we need to uh, model the infection of the cattle when they eat the grass and how the larva continue the development inside the stomach until they become adults and move to the intestines and produce eggs. Okay, so that's what we have and this is what we want to construct. Uh, larva are ingested and they move into the stomach and then we have something really funny uh, uh, coming up. Some of them will continue their development. Others will, will inhibit their development, waiting for the right time to continue. It's, it's not yet well understood how they do it. Why some inhibit the development and why others continue. Well, you have to test some hypotheses. So the model is also used to test those hypotheses. How, how do they detect that they inhibit the Well, so it, it will depend on how long they stayed in the grass. Seems to be that they are able to detect a gradient in uh, light. So they know if it's spring or fall, for example, or, or summer or winter because of how the days shorten the photo period. Photo period, basically. Uh, this is the most um, reasonable uh, hypothesis. 
assumption. Uh, people think also that depends on the temperature uh, at, at exposure when they are on the grass. Um, they can survive quite a long time in the grass if, the, if it's humid. Uh, so we, we tested a little bit uh, of, of uh, this hypothesis in the model. And uh, the most reasonable one really is the photoperiod uh, uh, hypothesis. Depends on the photoperiod. So you have some of them that will continue their development and it will take 21 days to become adults. It, it's fixed. Uh, it, it just happens like that, 21 days. And those that are inhibited and wait for the right time to de-inhibit and become adults. So we need to write those equations to have the full model and then uh, estimating the number of adults inside each animal will give us the X to complete the full cycle. So the equations we had for the larvae in the pasture were uh, these here. Now we want to estimate those that are ingested and the most uh, reasonable is sim and simplest uh, assumption is to think that uh, the animal we will be able to uh, ingest proportionally to the number of larvae in the grass. So we have that, that proportion and the equation is now set and we have to focus on the inhibition, the inhibition problem. Uh, we suppose that those that are inhibited uh, are here, are a portion of those uh, ingested and those that are not inhibited are the rest. But we need to define what the proportion is depending on what. So we know it depends on the number of days that the L3 cohort spent in the pasture and uh, the main daily temperature and the photoperiod. And this is a very usual expression of, of photoperiod depending on the latitude. The desinhibition process shows two phases. This is data. Depending on the season uh, in which the larva reached the pasture. So the hypothesis is that the photoperiod is the main factor determining the moment in which the inhibition occurs. And it, it, it seems right. It, it, we, we can fit the data with that. Field experiments show that the, ingested, the larva ingested before spring and the inhibition before the beginning of summer and the, ingest, the larva ingested after the beginning of spring and inhibition at the beginning of the fall. So we have this function set up depending on the photoperiod uh, which gives us the day in which they start the inhibition. So we now work on how the adults appear and we have that the number of adults will uh, be the number of adults surviving from the previous day times those that were ingested 24 days earlier and have completed the development uh, plus uh, those which are starting the development. They, they have resumed their development and became adults at uh, the, the appropriate time. So now we, the, the only piece lacking here is how eggs are produced, how many eggs are produced. And uh, for that, once we have that, we have the complete model. The number of eggs produced will also depend on, on weather conditions. Okay, I said, well, we have the different equations, you have seen them. Uh, now the fuzzy inference systems. Why we choose to parameterize uh, the model with fuzzy logic? In fact, uh, we tried several other methods and these seem to be the most uh, appropriate and the most satisfying with further results. It makes possible to represent linguistic expressions, as I said before, uh, and allows to include information that is not 
impossible to uh, give in, in, in terms of numbers, non-quantifiable. Um, it allows to uh, use, uh, give information to the model without replacing, totally replacing CRISP's logic. Now, this is a first, I'm not saying that this is the most wonderful way of parameterizing the model. But it's a good way if you don't have enough data. If you have lots of data, then you can use other types of function probabilities, uh, other, <coughs> other tools that will give you a better model. But when you don't have that information, this is a good way to handle the problem. So what you call crisp logic is basically binary? Yes, mm -hmm. binary logic. It permits a flexible design. If you have more data, you can add it to your, your functions. And it proves the model performance, and it's easy to implement. So what is a, a fuzzy set? I don't know how many of you already have seen this. Uh, it's, it's defined uh, in a universe, x, as it, you define a set of pairs. Uh, where the first component belongs to that uh, universe and mu is the, uh, a value between 1 and 0 that represents uh, how, what is the degree of uh, belonging of that x to a given set A. It, you can look at it as a uh, Sort, sort of probability function. It's not a probability function. Okay. But you can say, well, um, say you have, uh, you say, well, it, if 30 degrees Celsius, it's, it's, it's hot. If it's 10, it's, it's cool. Now, 15, how, how much it's cool and how much it's hot? It's in between, but you have to define it's, it's, if it is on the cooler side or in the warmer side and you give it a membership to the interval uh, 0, 1, of a value between 0 and 1. Um, the sum of mu's over a's has to be 1. Uh, not necessarily. That's why it's not a probability function. Not necessarily. Uh, this suggests that uh, the membership if, uh, in a fuzzy set should not be just 0 or 1, which is the, the crisp uh, logic, the binary logic, but somewhere in between. So uh, the membership functions are used to quantify this degree of membership of an element, and the choice depends on how much information you have. Uh, it can be any of these functions. Uh, if you have, for example, uh, a triangular function, this means that here you are absolutely certain that this value belongs to the set. It's 1. And here you are absolutely sure that these values do not belong to the set. And but he your x, x is here? Oh, here, this is just a, a value, say, say temperature, for example. OK, say temperature. Uh, here you know that these values here do not belong to the set. But uh, here, as you approach from not belonging to certainly it belongs, you have a, a, a gradient. Okay. And uh, you, you can have any of uh, these functions. We mm, basically use this, these four types in our model. Uh, this is the uh, binary uh, set. And um, in order to assign this degree of membership, you have to follow some rules. So you need a, a set of, of rules uh, that have this format, if this happens, then this happens. And uh, the, this rule expresses the relationship between two fuzzy uh, sets A and B. Uh, which are represented by a logical implication, uh, mu, where you have x belonging to A and y belonging to B. Now, I didn't follow, but can you 
again? Yes. A rule expresses a relationship between two, two uh, elements of two different sets. So if you, you have two elements, x and y, you have a rule that sets the relationship. X could be the temperature and y is the... Uh, development rate. Okay. Yes? Or, or rainfall and migration. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? I, I will the show usual, you. The usual syllogisms are performed if x is a, then x is b. It's applied. No, no, this, same. yes. This is Here is, is a relationship between two different sets. Okay, so. Syllogisms are just inclusions of sets. A, set a is part of set b. Right. This, this is uh, the, the difference with fuzz, fuzzy logic, where things are blurry. Now, uh, a fuzzy rule-based uh, system has four components. We give it a, an input and we get an output. And what we want is give uh, information as an input and get a number as an output. So, <coughs> what do we have as components? First, we have an input processor. The input processor is a uh, non-quantifiable input is translated into fuzzy sets. For example, today is warm, today is cool, today is rainy, today rainfall was very strong, it was a downpour. Uh, or rainfall was really very, uh, how you say, jovisna, uh, <laughs> uh, very, very yeah, light. light, light, very light rainfall. Okay. So this is the type of information that you said the farmers had. Exactly, yes. It's sort of expert system type. So yes. So you to combine expert system type of modeling with standard... Factual things, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But these are the parameters. The equations are, are, are uh, set up and we need to give the parameters to those equations. Okay, now, as I mentioned before, we need the rule base that relates sets, the relationships between those sets. For example, temperature and uh, mortality rate, or rainfall and mortality rate, or migration rate, or development rate. With the rule base, well, this is the, the knowledge encoding component, uh, with the rule base, we can generate the fuzzy inference machine. The inference machine... Sorry, can you go back because you had something written on the right that I couldn't read to the bottom. I'm sorry. Basically, a collection of fuzzy conditional probabilities, essentially part of the Cartesian product of the universe. Okay, fine. Cartesian product, right? I'm sorry, I was uh, very fast, going very fast. Now, the inference machine is the machine, the, 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 the system that allows you to uh, perform this reasoning using the, pos the compositional rule of inference. From that, what you get is a fuzzy set. Now, you want a number. So you need to find a way to transform this fuzzy set into a number. And this is done by the fuzzifying the, uh, the results. Um, the output processor provides real valued output through the falsification, a process used to choose within the set a number that is representative of that set. Okay? This seems very confusing, but I, I'll show you just in a minute how it works. Okay, so this is the fuzzy. a good job of de <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's the most important, probably. <laughs> So this is also called uh, F FIS, a uh, fuzzy inference system. It's shorter than FRBS. Okay, so let's go back to, for example, the development time from egg to larva. What do we have? We know that temperature has an effect and we know that the larval length has an effect. So uh, here was the model and uh, uh, here we have the three parameter functions that we need to build. 
we choose a Takagi Sujino type of, uh, of inference system and we choose those functions. They are uh, uh, four are triangular and two are sigmoid, sigmoid. Using the data from the paper by Pandé. This was, was the very controlled lab experiment saying at this temperature uh, we have this development rate, at this temperature we have this development rate. So we have six temperature classes and uh, these are the functions related to these temperature uh, uh, classes. These are the functions that are built using the data. Those are the numbers related to each one. And when you translate it through the FIS, what you get using that equation that we uh, proposed for the development, these are the functions. These are the results. Okay? And those are the functions we use for parameterizing these equations. Do you believe, <laughs> do you believe the, the little wiggles? Uh, this is what you get with the data you have. Yeah. If you have more data, then the function becomes smoother. Yeah, but shouldn't, shouldn't you smooth it? Uh, uh, not necessarily, because uh, uh, which would be the, the best, smoothing it or not smoothing it? Uh, it, it works fine with this one. When you, uh, when you use it, uh, you, you, you give this uh, information to the model, w the numbers you get uh, reflect what the experiments were, were giving. The, the thing is that the experiments also are uh, discrete in the sense that they were performed at, at five degree steps. So you don't really know what's in between. You have sampling and when you have sampling you cannot believe the small wiggles. Right, sampling yes. Errors. Yes, you have errors there. Yes, certainly. Certainly you have errors. But uh, it's, it's okay. It, it, it does reflect that at, oh, I'm sorry. At uh, about uh, 30 degrees, uh, you have um, lower, th this, is, this is clear, this is one. Actually, some of the points are, are certainties because you have uh, all the experiments done at, at 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 degrees. I just wanted to notice that the sum of those uh, uh, functions is pretty much Yes, in that case, yes, 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 but not necessarily, okay. yes. It depends, uh, if, if you take trapezoidal functions, then you will have uh, uh, a different situation. Where do you see that? It's yeah, well, if it, you look at the colors, yes. just throw a look at yes. it on the left. Yeah. Yes, yeah. here. That's the one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, in this case, it's, it's uh, right. Okay, these are the uh, experiments that were performed at the university that gave us the data that we used for, for both calibrating, or creating these functions, and also for corroborating later. Um, obviously, separating the sets. Uh, we have a paddock located at the university campus. Uh, the paddock was divided into 16, 16 experiments. Uh, two naturally infected calves contaminated the sub paddocks with eggs, fecal samples were taken weekly uh, from the contaminated calves. Uh, fecal egg counts were, uh, were uh, used to plot the contamination of the paddock. Copper cultures allowed the identification of the nematode species. Cop um, uh, Ocetagia and Coperia were the most uh, abundant. On the 15th day of each month, fecal matter was collected from the paddock and examples were taken in the lab to uh, keep track of the development of the eggs inside, inside the dung. Uh, grass samples were regularly taken from the paddock and uh, larvae were counted. Well, what data we have? The number of eggs per gram from field data 
And this is what they gave us. Now, um, they, for example, if they sampled uh, on this day, they reproduce the same number for the uh, days after that until they sampled again. So what we have is data like this. So it's not daily data, actually. It's data on one day, and they reproduce the same number until they have another set of, of uh, results. This is important when you want to check the model. OK, so the simulations were run using mean daily temperatures uh, at Tandil over this four-year period. And here you have uh, the data, the temperature data. And here you have the development times on a computed on a daily basis. And uh, OK, th this is what the model gives us. But if you look at the data from the lab experiments, this is what you have. So this would be the model, the red, and the rounds are the data. Uh, there is, you have to take into account that since they replicated the number over several days uh, until they had another result, and then used that until they had another result, this is why. These, these values are not actually uh, daily data with the daily temperature and so on. It's, uh, there is a, a difference in the methodology uh, in, in which these numbers are reproduced. Sorry, but what are the, uh, those error bars? The error bars? OK. Here we because have. Uh, the little circles look like the outside here. Yes, because they just didn't compute any errors. They, the, the veterinarians did these experiments, but uh, their own way, if I can say so. Um, these are the, the error from the simulations. Uh, the, the confidence interval from the, from the simulations we have. Uh, we perform uh, several statistical analysis of our data. And, and one thing that we did was to analyze how important is the order in which daily average temperatures occur. Why? Because in spring and in fall, you have same temperatures. But while on, on spring, temperatures tend to increase as you go uh, along, uh, in fall, it, they tend to decrease. So we wanted to know if the model could capture this difference and uh, if uh, the order in which the daily te uh, mean temperatures appear do have an effect in the development of uh, the larvae. And also, if we have two vectors, two temperature vectors, uh, which uh, have the same um, uh, mean value, if the ranges of the temperatures are different, how this e affects? You may have uh, a set of data with, with a given uh, mu, uh, mean value, but you can have a wider set of, of values of, of ther thermal amplitude. And if there is any significant difference, and the answer is yes. It does have a difference on how the dynamics are uh, uh, the, the dynamics of, of the uh, development. So the output error of the development time from eggs to infecting larva is less than the sampling error in the field experiments. Simulation of results yield a mean estimation error of uh, 0.64 weeks with a variance of 0.34 and a determination coefficient, which is uh, quite good given that we don't have exact data. The model exhibits high sen sensitivity to daily temperature variation and thermal amplitude. Now, uh, how does rainfall affect the life cycle? Well, it has two effects. It regulates migration from uh, the dung to the pasture, and it affects pre-infective mortality in the larvae. If they are not fully developed in the L3 stage, they will die with rainfall. If they are in the L3 stage, then they will be able to move to the pasture. But also, 
if they remain in the dung and there is no rainfall, they increase their mortality. So here we have uh, the uh, membership functions that represent age, age of the larva, uh, the um, season, so at what time, at what period the, of the year, and here rainfall. And we use a Mandami uh, set of rules with 40 rules that give us the mortality, the pre-infective mortality. So we have three age classes, which is L1, L2, L3. We have uh, the four seasons. We have rainfall as drizzle one, drizzle two, which is a little bit stronger, normal rainfall, uh, stronger rainfall, and the, the strongest uh, rainfalls that we can have in, in a tropical area. And uh, these are input, and the results are mortality, low, moderate, or high. And we have to pick up a value within these intervals. You see here you have an overlap. You have low from 0 to 0 0.35, but moderate from 0 0.2 to 0 0.6, and high from 0 0.5 to 1. So at some ranges, it can be uh, either low or moderate, or moderate or high. These are the functions and the type of functions for each one. L1 would be a Z, Z zygote, uh, an S zygote for L3, trapezoidal. Here are the uh, constants for the defining those functions. And these are the results we get. In a graph, we have this. For all each class of, uh, of rainfall, depending on the day of the year and the age. Let me show it again. You have the mortality function. This is for migration, the migration rate. Again, we have uh, season rainfall. Season and rainfall affect migration which could be very low, low, or moderate, or high. I'm sorry, this is in Spanish. Um, and here are the parameters for those functions and the results. And the graph would be this. Okay. So you have uh, rainfall and the day of the year. And you can see how uh, the seasonal effect shows up. So, what else we need now? We need the mortality in pasture uh, to give us the number of effective larvae. Again, we have uh, functions of this type. There are Z and S sigmoid and trapezoidal and give us triangular uh, mortality in the pasture. And this is what we have as a result. Again, uh, Season has an effect and temperature has an effect. And here you can see that mortality in pasture is very high in uh, December, January, and February, which is the summer in Argentina. Simulations that show us the dynamics of the infected larval population. This is a uh, number of eggs from field data. And this is what we have for the winter cohorts, how they add up in pasture, and then they die out. And this is for the spring cohorts, which is, you can see how uh, rainfall and temperature ha affect the number of larvae that you can find. This is adding up. Uh, here you have uh, the field data, which is the, the dots and the uh, simulation. Now, why does the simulation give us a larger amount of larva in the grass than the field experiments? It's because of the methodology of uh, the uh, collection of larvae. What they do is that they go very early in the morning, mostly before sunrise, and they cut one square meter of grass and bag it. 
and they take it to the uh, lab and count the larvae. Uh, just shift it and, and, and sift it and, and count the larvae. It depends on the humidity and also on the temperature uh, whether the larvae stay on the grass leaves or bury themselves in the soil. So it's reasonable to expect that you always have uh, less in your counts than what they actually are in the field. So this is, this is not surprising. So the larvae can climb on a leaf of grass? <coughs> yes, they can climb and they can bury themselves in the soil. If it's too warm, then they will try to, to, to bury. So uh, this would be the simulations for uh, the summer cohort. You see it's much lower because mortality is so high. And the fall. Normally, uh, the fall cohorts are the largest. And here again, you have, uh, it's, it's very difficult to count them uh, in, uh, in the summer. This is the peak of infection from field data and simulations. And we uh, can uh, match the data just in, in two cases in, in the winter. Uh, here we have beginning of infection. And uh, again, we have uh, for the spring uh, observations, we have a match. But we differ from the field data in the uh, warmer uh, periods. Uh, we can have a, peak of a beginning of infection from the simulations in January, but it's not observed in the field until almost the end of summer. And the end of infection uh, is it's pretty good. We have uh, almost all the time, uh, let me see, here, the only uh, only in one case here we have uh, a difference, but otherwise the end of infection uh, can be uh, found to match the field experiments. So uh, I go back to uh, these three main areas of uh, beef uh, for beef production in Argentina, and obviously we have uh, a lot of uh, latitudinal uh, differences. The simulations uh, in uh, using um, data from Marco Juarez. Marco Juarez is in the middle region in, in Córdoba. Mercedes is in Corrientes in the north. And Tandil is in the middle of, of the Buenos Aires province. Uh, this is uh, the model response to variation in temperature series. So you can see that uh, actually in the north, you have a higher uh, amount of larva in the winter, which is warmer than in the south while in the other periods, uh, it's more or less in, in the same orders of magnitude. Uh, if you look at the model response to the seasonality in precipitation, what we mean by seasonality in precipitation is uh, taking like uh, the, the rainfall over one season and nothing in the rest. So you can see that uh, if we look at the winter precipitation, uh, it has a, a strong effect on the larval response, while in uh, the just the summer, uh, precipitations uh, yield a very small uh, effect. The model act adequately replicates the dynamics of uh, the time at which the first larva appear, the days at which peak infections occur, and the duration of the infection, which is the best one. The simulation results suggest different implications about the effect of weather condition on infection. And uh, the model properly reflects the impact of seasonality uh, on pre-infective and infective larvae. Um, now, uh, the problem of uh, hypobiosis, the inhibition. Uh, the fuzzy inference system of a pandemic type uh, using as variables the number of days that the cohort spent on the pasture, the mean daily temperature, and the photo period. That, that's what we uh, picked for that. Uh, using the uh, Madame Lee uh, inference system, we use the time of exposure, temperature, and photo period 
to get the proportion of inhibited larvae. And the proportion, again, we have uh, triangular, triangular and uh, sigmoid in this case, gives us uh, this uh, Functions for, I'll show you again, for the three latitudes. This is for the uh, lower, middle, and higher latitudes. Uh, this is better. Not only you have here the uh, photo period, the representing the latitude, but also the temperature and how long the larva had been exposed. 3, 5, 7, or 12 weeks. You see how, how much it changes uh, at the, uh, for the proportion of inhibited larvae. And the, finally, you have the number of eggs produced. And uh, here again is a Madamni, uh, Mamdani uh, type. And uh, it's regulated by three variables. Parasite load, which means how many parasites the animal has the host age and the season. Uh, again, we have the parameters of those functions. And uh, this would be at different uh, loads, parasite loads. Where here you have the year from, from 0 to 365. And here the age of the animal. Sure. So we have the complete model, and we can go to simulations. Here we have, for the parasitic stage dynamics, the seasonal availability of larva in the pasture. This would be larva produced in the summer, larva produced in the fall, in the winter, and spring. And when you add them, you have this curve for the amount of larva uh, in the pasture. No, this is the simulation. This is the simulation. Um, here you have the response of the model to variations in temperature. The reference series is the temperature in Tandil over uh, a full year. I think it's this uh, 98, I think. Uh, and then we had, we added two and a half degrees and five degrees to that series to see how an increase in temperature uh, will, uh, will affect. And you can see how that, I, I'm, I'm just ending, I'm sorry. Um, how this affects the production of larvae. If you lower the temperature, you can see how this affects the production of larvae. This would be uh, the number of parasites depending on the latitude, how the latitude affects the production of larvae. The variations uh, depending on daily ingestion, uh, the proportion of uh, ingested larva, uh, again, above and below the uh, reference series. And the results coincide with the observed effects of the photoperiod variation. The model reflects the inverse relationship between temperature and the proportion of inhibited. Uh, the photoperiod uh, uh, shows that uh, increasing the, the the um, number of hours uh, decreases the number of inhibited larvae, and the grazing pressure uh, resulted in lower proportion of inhibited larvae. This is, these are the experiments of another uh, group of, of researchers published, Suarez, and we can replicate with the model. This is what they had, and this is what we have with the model, which perfectly replicates what they observed. Uh, let me go to the simulation of uh, parasite load and control using drugs. Well, these are the details of the experiment. But, uh, for example, in Tandil, a drug treatment uh, with this calendar using a drug that has an action period of uh, 55 days, 56 days, this shows what the normal uh, behavior would be uh, in black without any drugs and how the drugs affect. This is good to know which would be the date at which you have to give the drugs in order to get the maximum effect. In, in larva in the pasture, 
inhibited and adults. And uh, in the province of Santa Fe, which, which has a different uh, weather uh, condition, you have here the normal output and the drug treatment, how it lowers, depresses the number of larvae. Okay, so you have uh, uh, results on how to apply the controls, which months are effective and which months are not uh, re uh, convenient uh, for the dynamics. They don't, you can use the drugs, but it doesn't have any effect. Okay, the advantages of the model uh, are that it, it has a modular construction, it has very simple difference equations, and the parameterization is <coughs> using fuzzy inference systems. And if you have more data, you, then you can switch to uh, a more classic uh, method for that. Uh, well, I already said that. Thank you very much. <laughs>